recognize you. You go to the mic, state your name and where you're from, and ask your question. This uh, meeting is being streamed live on fcat.tv. Hey, John. Uh, can I just mention that this is not a town meeting, even though the size of it is a town meeting. So being a select board meeting, uh, not only Conway citizens can ask John to speak, but any other uh, citizen here that's uh, uh, from another town. Because again, in a town meeting, we usually have to vote to allow that. But this one. Thank you. All right, I'll ask Kinder Morgan to start their presentation. Yes, you're on. Good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and Board of Selectmen. Um, Pleased to be here tonight in Conway. This is our 31st town hall uh, presentation on our proposed Northeast Energy Direct project. Uh, I'm Alan Four, Vice President, Public Affairs with Kinder Morgan. And joining me tonight, Mark Hamrick, our project manager, uh, and Jim Hartman, um, our right-of-way manager. And uh, we're looking forward to your questions this evening and um, a good dialogue about a project that we believe is important uh, for the future energy supply for New England. I'll start off by talking a little bit about our company and, and what we do. Andrew Morgan, the parent company of Tennessee Gas, is a transportation and storage company. We don't drill natural gas, we don't sell natural gas, we transport it. And these are transportation lines across the country. We're the largest transporter of natural gas in North America with 70,000 miles of pipe, as you can see, servicing most areas of the country, including the DGP system uh, serving New England. And our pipes are transporting natural gas from the various shale plays and shale areas of uh, the United States. And traditionally, the gas from uh, New England has come from uh, the Gulf region here, Texas, Louisiana area. More recently, it's coming from the Utica and Marcellus shale area. You can see this large supply of, of natural gas here. Actually, a 100-year supply, the largest uh, shale supply in North America is, is really literally in your backyard. So that's where the natural gas is currently coming from, and that's where the natural gas for any future expansion of the region uh, will come from. So the Tennessee gas system has been servicing New England for over 60 years. Uh, it's about 13,000 miles of pipe serving 35 million households uh, in the southeast and northeastern United States. And we are a customer-based company. And what I mean by that is, is we deliver to customers. These are some of our customers here. You recognize some of these names, gas companies, power companies, and others that ultimately distribute energy to homes and businesses. So we deliver the gas through our large transmission lines to these companies who at the end of the day will deliver gas in the small pipes to homes and businesses uh, throughout the region. These are a list of towns that currently are part of our 600 mile natural gas system in, uh, in New England. And uh, what this means is these towns currently have some of our pipe going through the towns. And they have for many, many years. And when folks are asking about what are our relationships and how do we work with towns, I ask them to take a look at these towns and the towns we've worked with for many years in operating a system very similar to what we're going to be operating now. In fact, what we're talking about is an expansion of our current system uh, for our Northeast Direct project. And folks are also uh, that don't have natural gas service or natural gas pipelines in the area. So what does this look like? What does natural gas pipeline infrastructure look like when it's completed? So we took some photos re of recent, uh, these are actual photos recently taken of natural gas pipeline infrastructure in various parts of Massachusetts. And you've all probably seen these in your travels, these small above ground markers, which are simply that, they're not connected to anything, they're just markers indicating that somewhere below there is a natural gas pipeline. In this particular case, it's the Tennessee gas pipeline system. So you can see here an example. This is a pipeline right-of-way. There's a pipeline under here going back into this particular area. There's a pipeline going through here 
underground, and our piping is all underground. Um, and a pipe going through here, you can see what the crop's actually going on, on top of the pipeline right-of-way. Now, this isn't what every right, uh, pipeline right-of-way looks like, but it's typical. Uh, and you can certainly go to any of the towns that I listed uh, and see pipeline right-of-way for yourself. We're going through a lot of slides tonight, too. We'll be happy to provide the, the presentation to the town uh, for distribution so folks can take a closer look at some of the slides. Also, what else is part of pipeline infrastructure? A couple of photos here of uh, valve stations that we have, and you can see the size of those in relationship to the uh, marker that you saw on the previous slide, and also a compressor station. You might say that's not a compressor station, that's a barn. No, that's a compressor station designed to look like a barn. So we build our compressor stations in many cases to be compatible with the particular area, and this is a compressor station we recently constructed in uh, Southwick, Massachusetts. So. Our company does have about 600 miles. I mentioned you recall the Tennessee gas pipeline system. Um, this is the 600 mile piece that's currently servicing New England and the 40 plus towns I mentioned that are part of that system. Again, we're talking about here an expansion of this uh, existing system. So what is our project? What are we proposing to build? Why are we proposing to build it? Um, as I was just telling the, the young lady who was uh, uh, interviewing for the television station, uh, why are you proposing to do this? Well, we're, we're a transportation company. We build and operate pipelines. And as the largest pipeline operator in the region, when we uh, hear about a need for additional natural gas infrastructure, logically, we're going to look at how to address that. And in the last winter heating season, Massachusetts faced the, lar the highest natural gas prices in the country not in the region, in the country, because of a limitation on natural gas supply. The pipes servicing the region are full. So uh, these are some of the headlines that we're talking about, that the highest, most volatile prices in the country. Um, members of the uh, Senate delegation have talked about a need for additional natural gas infrastructure. And I'll be clear, I'm not saying any of these political leaders support our project. What I'm saying is they're talking about the need for additional natural gas infrastructure. The governors have said the same thing, talking about additional need for natural gas infrastructure and the potential crisis if that infrastructure need is not addressed and addressed very soon. Also, uh, in addition to natural gas, power generation, over 50% of the power electricity in New England now comes from natural gas, and that number keeps going up. And why is that? Because nuclear is less, coal is less, fuel oil is less, so you're left with natural gas and renewables. The use of renewables is also growing, but to meet the current demands and the future needs uh, for the foreseeable future, natural gas is going to be uh, the supply source. So it's going to continue to increase the use of natural gas in the region, again, affecting your constrained supply. Also, uh, we talked about previously about the Marcella Shale, the large shale area where most of the gas in New England currently comes from. Uh, that's also called fracked gas. You've probably heard of fracked gas. Well, currently 60% of the supply to New England in the current system, this is all systems servicing the region, comes from fracked gas. That's the Marcella Shale region. And within 10 years, almost a and this is whether or not there's a new pipeline or not, and there's certainly probably folks here would like to debate about frack gas and the appropriate use of it and, and all of that. But I just want to be clear, it's, it's not a question of where it's going to come from. It's not coming from overseas. It's not coming from Canada. It's not coming from the Gulf. It's coming from the Marcellus Shale. And that's the future natural gas use of the region if you want to have natural gas in the region. Uh, so what we're hearing from uh, customers and others is about why is this needed, and, and these are a couple examples of particular customers who currently use natural gas talking about the necessity of increases in infrastructure for power generation and for home heating. A worst case situation crisis could be if there isn't enough power generation or ability to get natural gas or alternatives in the dead of winter, you could be talking about brownouts. Now, a brownout in California in the summer isn't life-threatening. If you have something like that in the winter in New England, you could be talking about that. You're also talking about last winter, record amounts of fuel oil were, were used because there wasn't enough natural gas. Record amounts of fuel oil. This is more, than, more fuel oil that was used when fuel oil was a predominant source. 
because there's not enough natural gas. There has to be backup generation for the companies, and they're using fuel to do that. It's expensive, and it's not good for the environment. So these are real situations, part of a real crisis, not just New Hampshire and Massachusetts, but also the rest of New England. Maine is dealing with the same situation. Uh, so we're hearing more and more folks talk about uh, the importance of this. There is support for a project like this. I know it's not everywhere, and I'm sure a lot of folks here have strong opinions about it too, but I think on balance what people are saying is we need to address a long-term infrastructure need. Is our project the right project for it? That's going to be part of a debate, and we'll talk about our project specifically here in a moment. But when you have the Secretary of Energy Environment for the state of Massachusetts currently, Maeve Bartlett, just last week, this is officials predict costly winter for natural gas. Why? because of a constrained energy supply. This isn't Kinder Morgan or Tennessee Gas is talking. This is the head of environment and energy for the state of Massachusetts talking. So it's a real situation. The question is, how do we deal with it? Well, from a, a Kinder Morgan perspective of Tennessee Gas, we don't propose to build something unless we have confirmed, solid customer commitment for it. And what does that mean? Well, we ask for long-term customer contracts from those who want to ship on our line. So we announced a couple of weeks ago the companies, the 12 local distribution companies that have signed up for long-term distribution on our proposed line. And these are a list of some of those and our press release. Again, uh, we'll make this presentation available to those who want to take a closer look. It's also on our website. But local distribution companies who said, we want to commit to you uh, capacity on your line for 15 to 20 years. That shows us that it's not a hypothetical need, it's a real need for companies to contract for long-term natural gas service. So that's one of the key pieces that we need to have is the commercial certainty that a project like this is necessary. That's shown by contracts that will be approved. Uh, we put forth uh, to be approved by the Department of Public Utilities of Massachusetts as being in the best interest of the ratepayers. So uh, those contracts uh, are in process. The other part is the regulatory process. So we need to know that a project is commercially viable and we need to know that a project is permittable. And permittable means uh, meeting and exceeding the uh, very stringent and rigorous standards put forth by the state of Massachusetts and the Federal Reserve Regulatory Commission to construct pipelines. So let's talk a little bit about the process and that regulatory process and what it means. As we stand here today, we have not filed a single document related to this project with regulatory agencies. So it is still a potential project. We're still in the beginning phases here of this project. Consultations, town hall meetings like this, but no formal process has begun. We anticipate beginning that formal process here in September of this year, next month. And what happens at the beginning of this process? Then begins the formal process of public involvement and discussion and comment about our project to the regulatory agencies, particularly the FERC. And that will happen through open houses and scoping meetings. Open houses are company-sponsored events where folks will come in to learn more about the project. Uh, scoping meetings are public hearings uh, sponsored by the federal government. It will also begin a process uh, where we form a docket uh, with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission where there'll be documents that are filed that you all can view, public inspection. You can go to the FERC website, ferc.gov, and sign up for our docket number and get all the information that we file that's associated with this project. That'll begin that process. So we'll review the route, take public comments. I suspect there will be many variations to our proposed route through that year. We've already probably had 100 uh, different variations already on our route based on public input and we expect to have many more. That will lead to uh, the fall of 2015, about a year from now, when we actually will file our permits on a state and federal level for the project. So then begins the formal review of our project uh, about a year from now. Uh, that will lead to environmental impact statements being conducted by the federal government uh, and the state of Massachusetts through, through the MEPA process. Um, statements issued on that, more public comment, more public review, final statements issued on that, leading to potential FERC approval in the fall of 2016. And approval means that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, those are five commissioners appointed by the President, 
will vote in a public setting at one of their public meetings uh, whether the project is or isn't in the public interest where they would issue or not issue a certificate of public convenience and necessity. If that happens, uh, we would anticipate initial construction activity beginning in the first quarter of 17, uh, in service uh, fourth quarter of 2018. So as you can see, as we're standing here today, we're four years away from a project at the earliest that this project potentially be in service. So we have a long road ahead of us, lots of public involvement, lots of public discussion, and I'm sure lots of public debate. So let's take a look at our route, our proposed route of the project. Um, it's really in two parts. First is the supply piece. This is coming from the shale region that I mentioned, uh, where shippers will put the gas into our line to ship ultimately to Drake it. So the supply piece here uh, and the customer piece here. Uh, so uh, we are co-locating with our existing infrastructure through, through the section from right to approximately the Richmond area. Uh, and then Richmond to uh, Drake it, co-locating in some areas with Western Mass Electric. Some of this is Greenfield, which means there isn't other existing infrastructure in the particular area. Uh, and this is a corridor. This isn't a specific route. This is a corridor where we're currently in the process of conducting survey on that corridor. About 50% of the landowners that are impacted by the project have granted us survey permission to take a closer look at that. I mean, civil survey, environmental survey, cultural surveys, taking a closer look at the area to make sure it, in fact, is constructible um, because we need to have a project that is permittable and constructible. So we'll continue to take a look and refine this route. We're working with, uh, for example, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to look at areas where we could potentially co-locate with roadways uh, more. Uh, working with the Department of Transportation, both in uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Uh, working with the Department of Energy, Energy and Environment to, and, and the agencies that are supporting that, like Fish and Wildlife and Conservation and Recreation, to see if there are areas where we can avoid certain areas that the state considers of critical importance. So that is part of an evolution of a pipeline route, is to uh, work with stakeholders, work with regulators to try to develop a route that is the least impactful uh, while still delivering to a service area that is needed by our customers. And part of that service to customers is developing lateral. So we anticipate the main line on the project. That's the, the red area here and the blue area here to be either 30 or 36 inches. We haven't made the final determination. That will be identified when we start our pre-filing process. But a 30, 30 or 36 inch to smaller, uh, what we call laterals. Uh, for example, the West Nashua lateral here, which I believe will be a 12 inch smaller pipe. It's taking gas off of the big pipe to service a particular area. In that case, Liberty Utilities in New Hampshire wants to expand their natural gas footprint and provide more natural gas to customers. So we're, we're building these smaller laterals to address certain needs of particular customers. So that's all part of it. And this is currently the configuration of those laterals. I mentioned the regulatory process. You can see the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the lead federal agency, but also the Army Corps of Engineers, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and other agencies are part of the regulatory process and will need to secure permits from all of those. The state of Massachusetts, uh, from the state legislature to the Energy and Environment Agency, Fish and Wildlife, DCR, DPU, and other agencies that are supporting to that, and also uh, town conservation commissions will have a role in the review process of this project. The FERC process is extensive. These are some of the uh, numerous steps that are part of that process. You can see a lot of opportunities for public input through the process, um, both during the pre-file and filing process, um, uh, and input is certainly welcome. The towns that are part of the current configuration of the expansion are listed here. This means in some way uh, we will be impacting the borders, uh, the jurisdictional borders of these various communities. So to Franklin County, the blue line is our proposed route traversing the county. This is again a, a corridor that we're currently surveying and refining. And then specific to Conway, uh, this, the proposed corridor we're looking at here. I think that involves about 14 landowners, or is that right, Jim? About 14 landowners. Four, about four miles? Okay. 
So as part of uh, a construction of a project, this will be about a $4 billion uh, construction project. Uh, we expect to employ about uh, 3,000 uh, union construction workers. We've signed a memorandum of agreement with the laborers union, uh, also uh, with the Teamsters and the operators and the building trades to make this 100% union project. Those will be uh, over the primary two years of construction of the project, but it's also much longer than that because the project will generate uh, additional distribution, we expect, from the distribution companies growing their systems, which will lead to additional construction jobs, and we fully believe additional economic development, which will lead to even more jobs. So we expect those jobs to, to last for, for quite some time. Um, it will also provide the opportunity for additional natural gas growth over the long term. Now, I know there's not natural gas service here locally. Will this mean that the area will get natural gas service that depends upon the distributors of natural gas uh, and those who, um, utilities and others who are part of that distribution system? We simply get the gas to a destination, but it's likely we, we have heard from our existing customers that they plan to and hope to expand their systems um, in the future to allow more natural gas service to more homes and businesses. Also, the tax revenue in the town would participate in this, receiving annual tax revenue, uh, property taxes that are based upon the valuation of the pipe system. It's about $25 million for the state of Massachusetts. So the portion that's impacting here in uh, Conway, the town would receive part of those proceeds on an annual basis. Uh, so the part of the outreach process is, it was the 31 town hall meetings we've done. We've done countless other meetings um, with uh, all types of stakeholders, individual landowners, the, the over a thousand landowners that are part of uh, the project, uh, all are being contacted and receiving individual consultations, the elected officials that are part of it. This is a list of folks who have been briefed. Again, I'll emphasize again that these doesn't mean any of these political leaders are supporting us. It simply means we've reached out to them to talk to them about the project. And that's important because we know this is a big project for the region. It attracts a lot of attention, a lot of interest, a lot of debate. And we want to make ourselves available and accessible to talk about it to anyone who's interested in talking about it. These are the list of presentations uh, we've done starting in Montague in April, just in Stamford, Connecticut last night. And I think we've got about probably four or five more towns to visit, and then we'll have visited all the towns who've asked for public presentations on the project. Uh, we also partner with communities uh, that we pass through, emergency responders, uh, parks. We partner with the Arbor Day Foundation to plant trees. And these are voluntary things that we do far uh, in excess of the mitigation and other requirements that we have as permits. We try to be a good corporate citizen and neighbor. And we also know this, I, I cite this as an example of a project we recently had in New Jersey. This is one small example of hundreds of examples like this that we do on projects where we know we're going to have mitigation impacts. And citing a pipeline is a tough process for all involved, and we wanted to have a pipeline that has the least impacts possible, but you can't avoid everything. And when you can't, you try to be creative about mitigation opportunities. And this is one small example. This was a 40-mile pipeline we had, and there was much more mitigation than this. But I cite this as a particularly creative way to partner with the Highlands Council, which is a land trust organization in New Jersey, the Department of Environmental Protection, and Tennessee Gas Kinder Morgan, where we impacted a few acres of land, and in return for that, we bought 147 acres of prime forest and critical wildlife habitats and donated that to the Highlands Council. So their overall footprint of protected land increased significantly for our temporary impact to the pipeline. So that's an example of the kind of creative things that can be done to mitigate impacts on pipeline projects. And we also have our Kinder Morgan Foundation uh, that donates to uh, homes and schools. So we do really try to be good corporate citizens and neighbors, both in the short and long term. And with that, be happy to answer questions. Alan, I'm going to take the first question. Of the 3.7 miles of pipeline that are scheduled to run through Conway, how many miles of that pipeline will be in existing easements? Um, I think the question, none of them will be in existing easements, but about 70% of it at this time is, is proposed to be co-located 
adjacent to power line easements. Okay, with with uh, the Wamiko. With the with, with the, the power Wimico. line easements. Okay, yes. so about seventy percent. Right, but we'll have to negotiate that. easements mm -hmm. with the power company and adjacent to it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Who wants the next question? Mary, why don't you come up to the mic? <clears throat> Mary, would you would you just state your name and and where you're from? Is that better? Okay. I'm just curious. Um, name, name, Mary. Well, my name is Mary Irwin. I'm from Conway. And my question is, since you have an existing pipeline through Massachusetts that's located closer to high population areas where you can provide more service, where service is needed, why are you choosing, and could you not just make bigger pipes? Why are you going through, you know, um, virgin land in areas where there's very little population to benefit from the gas? Okay, good question. So we do have existing pipe here called our 200 system uh, going through, uh, coming in roughly the same area where this project would uh, go north, south. You can see here, it's a little difficult to see on this map, but there are currently, uh, the, there are three pipelines uh, going from, from Richmond into the uh, first part of Massachusetts, and then we have two lines after that. What's happened here is this pipe, a lot of this pipe was installed uh, in the 50s. And since that time, there's been significant growth around the pipeline infrastructure. In fact, in many areas, there have been subdivisions that have literally gone up to the 25, the 50 foot easement, 25 each side of the pipe, 25 foot easement of the uh, pipeline. So there's no room to expand existing infrastructure, to, to build additional uh, piping in that particular corridor. Uh, so that's, that's a, a key reason. However, uh, as part of the uh, pre-filing process, we're required to not only identify our preferred or preliminary route, but we're also required to identify alternatives and talk about what I just said very high level in more detail. So we'll be talking about the 200 line and what our alternative analysis is of that line. So you can take a look at that um, when we do our filing and get some more specifics on that. The other reason is the service of, of, of customers. Um, the, uh, we're looking at additional customer, additional customer base along this, this part of the line. We ha do have to get to Drake it. So we have to get to Drake it with this line. And we're looking at additional customer bases um, throughout the route of the, the northern route. So it is based upon uh, customer interest. It is based upon constructability. It is based upon getting from point A to point B um, in a process that takes into account all of the uh, applicable rules and regulations regarding pipeline siting. Now those are environmental concerns. They're also landowner concerns. So you have to look at the number of landowners that will be potentially impacted by your project. So when we're talking about routing, we need to look at a variety of situations and circumstances. Um, environmental issues are key, but so are landowner issues. So we're trying to reduce the number of landowners as well. For example, uh, I think you'll see in, in our alternatives analysis when we look at this route, that the uh, co-location route could potentially be involving as many as a thousand more landowners, double the number of landowners than the northern route. So that is a factor that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission looks at in citing is how have, what have you done to lessen landowner impacts? Environmental impacts are very important too, also landowner impacts. So our preliminary route uh, will be shown in more detail, much more detail. We'll have very detailed maps when we do our filing next month. And you can take a look at it. It'll be open for public review. Uh, but we'll also be identifying this. There's also, uh, some have t su suggested, why don't you go right down the middle of the Mass Pike? That sounds like a logical way to construct a pipeline. Um, the Department of Transportation doesn't think so. But um, we'll take a look at that. We'll, we'll, we'll do a closer uh, alternatives analysis on that, Route 2 is another uh, area that we're, we are taking a closer look at and we'll have uh, some uh, detail on that. But we have to look at a variety of factors 
um, in proposing a route for a pipeline. At the end of the day, it's not our call. We propose where we're going to put the pipeline. The regulators will ultimately tell us. So we've, through discussion, had over 100 variations in the route so far. We anticipate there will be many, many more, some small, 10, 20, 100 feet, some large, could be several miles. That will all be part of this, this review process as we try to lessen the impacts while keeping in mind what the regulators uh, require for siting of pipelines. Someone over here had a question? C come on up, sir. Good evening. My name is Mark Selby, and I live in Ashfield Road. Uh, I live in Ashfield, Massachusetts, on the oh, on Beldingville Road, right on the Conway Line. And I have a question about compressor stations. My understanding is that from right New York to Conway, uh, there's going to be a compressor station uh, directly into uh, the Conway um, um, Township, and from there directly, um, uh, there's not going to be an in, in intervening compressor station. Up, and, up until we get to Drake it. So my question is, is that station going to be one of the largest ones in the country? Two, if you have to um, pig the uh, a compressor station, are you going to have um, gases? You're going to have um, um, solid materials that are coming out. And what I'm asking is, is there, um, there evidence-based science that uh, document uh, what those solids are and what the risks are uh, to the local environment. I'll, I'll start and then Mark can talk specifically about the, the construction of our, our compressor stations, the operation of those. What we do know is we anticipate having a compressor station at Wright and a compressor station at Drakett. Will there be others along the line? It's very possible. It depends upon uh, what our customers need and what size of pipe we put in. So it's possible there will be additional compression. Those are not located yet. We haven't decided where we propose to put those. It will be disclosed in our filing. Uh, we'll list where uh, the area where our compressor stations and in we intend to site those if there are in addition to the two that I mentioned. Uh, but that will be part of the filing process. But no deci final decisions have been made on compressor stations and where they will be located. And the other part of that question is the um, solid effluent, uh, you know, that comes out of the station. I'd like to, underst I'd like to understand s some of the evidence-based um, science behind what the threats are, and I'd like you to cite some periodicals that we can refer to. Yeah, let me, let me go to your first question. You talked about, you asked if this was, you know, Alan talked about the siting or the location of compressor stations. We don't have locations. We don't know how many and where they're going to be. You also asked... Would this be, you know, one of the largest compressor stations in the United States? From what we're looking at, it will not be one of the largest compressor stations in the United States. Um, at a typical compressor station, Alan showed you a, a picture of one. That's a relatively smaller site. We would be looking for a little larger site, but we would still have it housed in a building in an enclosed area for operations. Now, you, you also asked about the pigging, and I just want to describe the pigging. Um, when, you, when you have a pipeline, what pigging is, a pig is just really a, a sphere that is put in the pipeline, and there's different types of pigs or spheres that you put in the pipeline while the pipeline's in operations, and it runs in the gas stream, and there's multi-purposes for that pig. And the way the pig is entered into the pipeline, there's a, a device on one side of the pipe where the, the gas is vented, a minor amount of gas, the pig is entered, it's loaded, it's run through the pipeline, and it's taken out on the other side, typically 50, 70 miles apart. A couple of pigging processes. We pig the line to, to check for any kind of wall loss or anomalies as part of our integrity program. And prior to doing that and in other areas, we may run this pig or this spear through the line, and I think what you're asking is, when we run that pig through the line for a cleaning, what comes out on the other side of that line? So in our typical operations through that, in this area, the, the specific question is, what is the analytical composition of, that, of that, that comes out? In this point, 
We have not pegged this line. The line's not been designed, so we don't have any analytical base. And the question was asked a couple of nights ago, and I don't have the information yet. Right. As far that as was the, the analytical. question that I asked in um, Dalton. Of, yes, two and nights you have ago. Other, so. <laughs> oh, and you have other sites. I haven't had a chance to and do the research, but we are going to look at that on. on what comes out. But everything, everything that goes out of that pipeline, whether it's an emission of, of the gas for the venting for normal operations or the pigging operations is all permitted and it's all within the, you know, it's all regulated and all controlled as to how we handle that substance, what we do with it, and how it's controlled after the fact. Are you willing to provide information uh, from other sites since uh, uh, compressed gas is going to have a lot of the similar uh, components in the Marseilles shale supply. We're committed to go back and, and look for information and see what we can find on our system to share. And you. uh, you'll provide evidence-based information for that? I don't know if the evidence-based information you're getting at, but uh, what, we are going to follow up on your question. And one last uh, quick question. Why do you require 50 acres in Conway? Well, we don't have any kind of uh, the compressor station cited in Conway or any other town across Massachusetts other than in Dracut that we know we've got to end there. The other locations, it's flexible at this time based on the design, whether it's a 30 inch, it's a 36 inch, it has to be spaced regionally. So we've not cited any compressor stations. 50 acres is a typical site. It could vary. It could be larger. One of the reasons we want a larger site is to keep the... the um, just isolate it from, from residences and any kind of growth in the area. Thank you very much. Right. Next question, Dave. Hi, I'm Dave Chichester and live in Conway. I have just two questions. One's a simple one. Why Drake it? I don't understand what's so special about Drake it. But secondly, uh, we spend, I'm involved with emergency management in town. Uh, and we spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out what can go wrong in Conway. Floods, fires, oil spills. Uh, and what I'm looking for is some kind of a commitment from you that you understand that there might be some emergency risk here. And what are you prepared to do to help the towns uh, get ready for this? Uh, we just don't know very much about this as a, as a public risk. Thank you. The, the, your first question, uh, Drake it uh, here. As you can see on this diagram, the, it, is a, it is a hub. It's a hub. There are several natural gas hubs across the country, but it's an area where pipelines connect to each other. Uh, also, there's significant uh, compression there where you can get gas to several different places. For example, going up in New Hampshire on our system. You could also get into the maritime systems. Part of this project is intended to provide natural, additional natural gas service to the state of Maine, for example. We can also backfill onto our current system uh, through Dracut. So Dracut is a collection of various pipes and areas to get gas to many different places. Uh, very common in the industry to have areas like this uh, where you can service uh, multiple areas of the region. Uh, to the second question about uh, emergency responders, we are committed uh, to working with emergency responders uh, during construction, before construction, during construction, and in service, uh, training emergency responders if there were a natural gas incident, how to respond to that. I showed you some of the photos of other partnerships we have done with communities and areas that we serve by providing equipment and other items. Um, and I, I encourage you to speak with the 45, 50 towns that have been part of our service uh, area for over 50 years and how we work with those towns and uh, the relationships we have with them and their emergency responders is an example of how we operate in Mass. Still can't hear you. There we go. Hello? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you. Welcome to Conway. My name is Barry Elson. I live in Conway on South Part Road. 
Um, I'm a physician practicing in Northampton. I specialize in environmental medicine and chronic illness. I was just reading a transportation website that according to the US DOT, since two, the year 2000, there have been over 990 significant leaks from gas pipelines. They define significant as if there's a fatality or an injury or greater than $50,000 worth of damage or other, um, like an explosion, other large events. So just uh, looking at this logically and rationally as to whether this frack gas will leak into our aquifer and get into our water, it's just a question of when. And the question comes up, what is in the frack gas? We know there are over 750 different compounds. We know that the companies that supply the frack gas refuse to provide the information as to what's exactly in them for approximately two-thirds of those uh, chemicals. We do know, however, that according to international peer-reviewed journals, that over 350 of those chemicals have been analyzed in terms of their health effects. We know that over 30% of those frack gases are carcinogens, they cause cancer. We also know that um, a, uh, over 80% of them affect the liver and the gastrointestinal tract. We know that over 50% of them affect the central nervous system. We know that over 40% of them uh, disable the immune system. We know that 40% of them damage kidneys. We know that uh, a large percentage of them, 50%, can affect the cardiovascular system and blood cells. We know that a large percentage, 30%, are mutagenic. We know that a higher percentage, 30 to 40%, cause estrogen disruption and birth defects. Uh, we know that uh, um, endocrine abnormalities also occur with these chemicals. So the real question is, why should we allow you to poison our town? Thank you. So I, the, the comments you make are certainly part of a, a large, extensive debate that I'm sure will be part of this project, but it's much bigger this project, about whether or not uh, and how frack gas should be regulated, should be used. What I can say is that, um, again, we don't drill, but we are transporting the frack gas. And it's the same gas that we have been transporting for many, many years to many, many parts of Massachusetts. It's the same gas. The same gas that would be delivered here is the same gas that's delivered to 600 miles and thousands and thousands and thousands of customers uh, across uh, Massachusetts, the same gas. But the larger debate, uh, your question is, is, is a timely and will be part of this larger discussion about distribution of gas to the region, but the reality is that gas coming to the region is going to be coming from the Marcellus Shale. It has been for many, many years. It will continue to be because that's where the natural gas is. Paul Jenkins, uh, Shelburne Falls Road. We know why you're going to Drake it. It's an ocean port, for God's sake. And it's, you know, as much gas as you can sell for a higher price overseas, the more that's what's going to happen. We call it profiteering. Why should we be asked to pay a tariff on our electricity bills in order for you to be able to build this pipeline? And beyond that, Why should we risk our conservation areas, woodlands, rivers, pastures, orchards? Why should we be asked to risk this for your profiteering? I think it is entirely criminal on your part. So 
So to your to your first comment about uh, the tariff, um, and there's oh about Drake it. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll talk about the tariff second about Drake it. Um, well, you know something that we don't because our contracts are with local distribution companies, and they'll be identified when we do our filing. So we don't have any contract with companies exporting natural gas. Now, our, our the system as all natural gas across the United States is open access. I'm sure you know that, right? And you know what open access means. Open access means, according to the Natural Gas Act, that your pipeline has to be open to companies with financial viability to contract on your system. So right now, while there's no uh, companies that have the ability to export anywhere or have the financial ability to contract with our company or any other for natural gas, could there be companies down the road that would? There could, because we're an open access line. We're an open access line now with our current system, as is Spectra, as are all natural gas lines. So any natural gas infrastructure as part of the interstate process are open access lines. So the possibility does exist, but we don't have any current natural gas customers that are interested in contracting in the, in the long-term contracts that we require. That's why we have local distribution companies, because they're able, they're financially secure and stable, the National Grids, the NSTARs, the Columbia Gases, the Berkshire Gases, those are the 12 customers that we have signed up for this project because they have the ability and the stability for long-term commitments to this kind of project. Second to your question about the tariff. So, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about a tariff, and I think it's important to draw a distinction of what the governors were talking about. All of the governors in the region were talking about a tariff that would apply to natural gas infrastructure and also to hydroelectric transmission lines from Canada. The two parts to the Massachusetts piece of that. That didn't pass. So right now, there is no tariff. There is no, uh, all, they kind of reset the, the, the process on that because Massachusetts did not pass that. They did not pass the governor's energy plan where that would have been part of. So you've got three governors, I think, that are up for uh, re-election and close races, and who knows will win those races. So I don't anticipate a lot happening with that multi-state process probably till after the new governors take office. We're moving forward with our project based upon our customer commitments. So if you're not part of one of those customer systems, the customers we listed that contract with the gas, you're not going to be paying for anything. So Berkshire Gas, the customers of Berkshire Gas, the customers of a National Grid, what they contract on our pipeline for, as is currently in practice, if you get natural gas, you're paying for a distribution charge on there somewhere. But if you don't get natural gas, you're not going to be part of this because you're not part of our customer base. I think what you're referring to is this larger potential tariff issue that all the states are talking about uh, enacting to grow natural gas and other infrastructure, um, but that has to go through a process which uh, did not pass currently. So I don't know if that's going to pass or not. Uh, it's anybody's guess what will happen there. I think you had one more. I don't remember. Oh, uh, the, 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 the lands and, and where we're, we're, we're siting and locating and, yeah, right. Right. So, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, part of this siting process is, is attempting to find the least impactful route. And a lot of folks will have different opinions on what least impactful means. The regulators, as I mentioned at the outset, number of landowners impacted. That's very important to lessen the number of impacts. Uh, landowners, environmental issues, wetlands, threatened and endangered species, a variety of issues like that, lessening the impacts there. So we're proposing what we believe to be a route that addresses those concerns. Um, since we've announced this preliminary route in a very preliminary <coughs> manner before filing any documents, we've had 100 route adjustments. And some of those have been with Jim and his uh, landowners he's working with for moving it to a certain side of a piece of property. Others have been several miles of adjustment that we're looking at to avoid particularly sensitive areas or, or, or other items like that. So it's a very fluid process. We expect that what we end up filing with as a proposed route will change 
several times through this year-long review process. Part of that coming from meetings like this and from other public input through the process. Diane. Good evening. Uh, Diane Poland, I live in Conway. Hi, I'm Diane Poland, and I live in Conway. Good evening. Uh, just to I have a question, but just a correction first. You mentioned early on that the Marcellus Shale was going to provide 100 years of natural gas. Now, <clears throat> the government agency, the Energy In Information Agency, does not agree with that. They say more like 30. The International Energy Association says more like mm, 12 to 15, and others say as little as five it's before the, it collapses. So that was just a, another alternative set of references. My question, though, does relate to export, <clears throat> which we've addressed a little bit. But Kinder Morgan has been at the forefront of negotiating with the Department of Energy for the past three years on getting in, export license application procedures in place. Uh, that is now complete. On August 15th, the DOE announced that these, these are ready for uh, developing applications, receiving applications. In fact, some applications for export have already been, uh, been the licenses have been granted. Now, uh, the reason for export, of course, is that in Europe, gas costs about three times at least as much as here. Now, you have stated publicly that you are going to sell to the highest bidder. Reasonably, you're a, you're a business and you're going to sell to whoever offers you the most money. Um, on August 15th, the Energy suppliers, it's the, uh, it's the professional association for large energy users, reported, uh, advised the Department of Energy that exporting gas is a poor idea in that it's going to impact domestic users with incredibly higher rates on their gas because we're competing now with the prices of overseas. Now, Kinder Morgan is, 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 is right there as far in the front of the application line. Uh, to get export licenses. Not quite ready yet, as you have said, because of, uh, locations have to be developed, et cetera, which are in the process of happening. So isn't it logical to assume that unless you're locking in your, your, the companies that you say are local um, to lower rates on a permanent basis, that the, the, the result of your energy exploration, your transmission of, of gas to Europe, is going to result in higher gas rates for us. I think you're referring to... I think you're referring to existing facilities that we have in Pascagoula, Mississippi, uh, and Savannah, Georgia, are the two facilities that are part of potentially being part of a uh, export system. That's where our two facilities are, Pascagoula, Mississippi, and Savannah, Georgia. That's public record. You can look it up. It's public record. And those are in the review process by the Department of Energy, certainly not part of New England, Pascagoula, Mississippi, and Savannah, Georgia. Um, but to your point about uh, the whole export process, um, you know, it's an interesting time we live in that we are not talking about we're talking about domestic energy independence when 15, 20 years ago we were talking about being held hostage by countries that don't like us very much. Um, something every president has tried to get to is domestic energy independence and we're almost there and that's because of the shale plays and the ability to transport and use domestic energy with current technology. But to your point, it's a regulated process. No one is going to be exporting anything out of the United States unless the Department of Energy and the FERC plays a role in this and the Congress plays a role in this. And it's up for an extended debate right now. Right now, uh, it's not happening in the United States. Uh, will it happen down the road? Will some happen? Some have said there should be a certain amount that's allowed to assist countries that are developing to get off of coal and other, other fossil fuels. Um, others have said there shouldn't be any. And it's a question of supply, and you mentioned the Marcellus Shale and the debate of how much supply is there. 25 years ago, the Marcellus Shale, while it existed 
It didn't really have a name and it didn't have any gas. But now we're talking about, even in your words, a 30-year supply. So it's part of a debate. It's part of a discussion, and it will be ongoing. It isn't our decision at the end of the day. It's the regulators on if or when uh, any gas is part of natural gas export. Jody Greenberg, Pazmandi, uh, Conway. And um, my first, I'd like to make a comment, and I would just like to say that um, at less than six weeks um, to the deadline for your proposal, it seems almost insulting that you would like to assert that you still don't know where you're proposing to place the compressor stations. I feel that it's a lack of honesty. Um, I think that you could at least give us some indication of some of the ideas that you have and to assert that you have no idea when you've been preparing, researching for many years, it seems extremely unlikely and I find it insulting. I really do. And my next, um, my next, I have a question and that is, um, what are your long-term commitments to maintaining and to um, decommissioning this infrastructure once natural gas has been either extinguished or is no longer a la mode, what, how, what do you plan to do with the infrastructure that you're creating once it's no longer useful and profitable to you? Thank you. So to your first question about the locations of uh, compressor stations, we are still in development. And it's important to, to understand what happens next month. This process to date, as I said, there's been no documents filed. This project is still simply a preliminary proposed project. Once we begin the review process, we'll identify at that time where we believe the locations to be of compressor stations and how many there will be. That could change. That could very well change. This entire route could change. There could be small or large adjustments to the route. It is still in development. It's still in development. Um, and it will be in development until we actually file in the fall of 2015 for our actual certificate. So this next year is intended for review and discussion about some of the comments um, that you have made, like you have made. To the question about what happens with the system um, if the FERC calls it abandonment, is if a pipeline is no longer in service or used for the transportation for what it was uh, uh, regulated for, so in this case natural gas. Um, if you decide for whatever reason uh, that there, whatever reason it might be, uh, that the pipeline is not going to be used anymore, uh, there's a process called abandonment that is a regulated process not dissimilar to the actual process for placing a pipeline. So we would have to go through a public review process and proposal and, and um, a regulated process to determine uh, whether we could abandon, first of all, and then how it is abandoned. Uh, is it better to leave the pipe in place or is it better to remove it? Uh, those are decisions that we made by the regulators. But there is a formal process to go through called abandonment with FERC if you decide um, for whatever reason no longer to use that particular infrastructure. Could that be um, converted to another tra transmission of other materials? of other, something other than natural gas? That, that would be actually part, part of an abandonment process too. Uh, you would have to, first of all, the, the FERC would have to regulate, because they regulate uh, the pipelines themselves and also the, the gas supply for the country really and the infrastructure system. So they would have to be part of that process too for abandonment of the existing product in the line and an entirely new regulate, regulatory process would be in place if you uh, had another product to put in the line. So you couldn't automatically do it. You have to go through a new permitting process. My name is Bill Como, and I live on Bardwell's Ferry Road. Uh, the proposed pipeline is going close to my property. 
and it has the potential of affecting my property values. Uh, I want to uh, uh, draw a comparison with something I heard recently, and if you guys know that I'm a little bit off here, help me with it. I think it was CVS recently that said they were going to discontinue the sale of cigarettes, saying that it's no longer in the public in health interest. Of course, it may be for PR purposes they're doing that, but this is an example, perhaps, of a corporation that's doing something that perhaps is right, whether it's for the right reason or not, it's right. I am wondering why Kinder Morgan, who right now you are saying that you are doing this to give us gas, much needed gas, you look like you're the good guys. You may be the good guys. But what I don't understand is with your contracting with people who are pulling out the fracked gas, transporting it through my neighborhood, why you can't put corporate pressure, use your corporate influence, use your corporate muscle to say the public wants to know what kind of chemicals are being transported through the pipeline that you are creating. You have a responsibility to let us know that. I want to know what kind of chemical may pollute my well. I think I'm not the only one who smells a rat here that feels like we're going to end up being screwed. If there is, a, if there is an accident, who is going to take care of my well? I don't think it can be fixed. I really don't see how it's going to be fixed. What are you going to do? I don't even know what chemicals in there? Why can't you guys demand from the companies that are producing the gas to let us know what the chemicals are? We have a right to know whether our property and whether our health may be in danger for it from that. And you guys being up there reminds me a little bit about uh, what were called, quote unquote, the seven dwarfs who stood before Congress and said, we don't know anything about the health effects of cigarette smoke. No, we don't see anything wrong with it. And of course, documents showed that they were not being truthful. So why cannot you guys, this is my one question, why cannot you guys use your corporate influence and say the public, not only in Conway, Massachusetts, but in all these other communities that have had these forums, really want to know what's being transported and what the chemical consequences of a spill will be and what you will do to rectify the situation if there is, if there is a, a, you know, a leakage. I just want to, um, the, the fracking process is, is a way to extract the gas. We're not in the fracking business. I'm not a fracking expert. When that gas is put in the pipeline and it's transported through the system, it's a closed system with the gas in it. There are some traces of toluene and benzene, minor traces in the natural gas stream. I don't know about the 600. We had 700 quoted the other night. and we have a responsibility to go back and, and understand a little better what's in that gas. But our research has showed it's trace gas, trace amounts, all within federal limits. It's been, it's been being transported at this time. But I want, to, I want under, everyone to understand about the pipeline, what we transport in, in the wells. When you're talking about wells, what we do is we have an enclosed system. So should there be some sort of release of gas, and I talked about it earlier. There are controlled releases at compressor sites, possibly at, at launch, pigging locations, where certain small amounts of gas are vented to the atmosphere during normal operations. The gas is lighter than air. So remember, we're talking about natural gas. It's lighter than air, and it'll dis dissipate up upwards. Should there be some event, whether it be a leak or some other kind of release of gas in the ground, that gas will be released to the atmosphere. It's not gas that will be released and gone into the groundwater and have anything to do with the wells. So 
that I want to I want to clarify that concept because we get that a lot. It's we're not out here fracking gas along the pipeline. Now we are installing a pipeline. When we install the pipeline and we trench in those areas, we do test the wells that are next to within a certain distance of our corridor of our pipeline, 200 feet I think on either side is our standard. We go further what it'll, it'll land on we pay for that testing we make sure that our construction process through the trenching process doesn't impact any kind of wells whether it's the water quality or the production of the well we pay for the pre-testing at the landowner's permission the post testing and make sure the construction but this concept that gas is going to percolate out of the pipeline in a leak go into the ground and go into the wells is totally different than a drilling concept on wells Jim. and good evening Jim Hartman in the land department one of the things that you also brought up was property values and you didn't spend a lot of time on it but the the process if if the pipeline project goes forward and um, we then come out and meet with you um, each individual owner that we would cross and um, discuss easement rights impact your property mitigation that we could do on your property and, and make an offer for the easement. And I don't know what that is yet. That hasn't been determined. But um, we would be liable for anything that we were doing on your property as a result of our construction or our operation afterwards. And with regards to property values, um, studies have shown, whatever I tell you, um, you're probably not going to be completely um, believable, but there are studies on record that show that the easement for a natural gas pipeline on one property, as compared to a property across the street, are, are very similar. And I could direct you to some easement studies valuation that we have on our website, totally independent, and it's at kindermorgan.com under our natural gas pipelines, and you can study that yourself. And again, um, if we do have the opportunity to meet with any of you as part of our project, we can go over that with you. We'll spend as much time as we need to to, to work out whatever is necessary. Go ahead. Tammy Borton. I live here in Conway. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, has there been any discussion uh, amongst the regulators or any, at any of these town meetings or even the distributors to provide natural gas uh, to the areas along the pipeline that don't currently get natural gas. And then the second question is uh, you talk about the NEPA alternatives analysis and about how you're analyzing alternative routes. Uh, I was wondering if there was going to be any analysis of um, alternative energy sources. Oh, there's distribution. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the distribution piece, um, our, our role in this is the transportation to the distributor. And what we've heard and what, uh, and, and, and some of these ultra distribution companies have, have been with us at meetings like this, for example, in last night in Stamford, Connecticut, Yankee Gas, a Yankee Gas representative was there and was asked by some of the elected officials there about just that, about increasing their footprint in the Stamford, Connecticut area, and they are going to do that. They're planning on doing it, and they all have processes for doing that, and how many landowners need to sign up, and all the way down to how, who pays for it, and all those types of things. So I think uh, I'm seeing in their plans that they are talking about additional natural gas, um, uh, increasing their natural gas distribution network uh, to additional natural gas users from a commercial uh, and homeowner basis. Is there a guarantee that that will happen or when that will happen? No, there is not, but I know there is discussion about that. And, 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 ex and increased, significantly increased natural gas supply makes that possible, where before it wasn't when the pipes are full. Sir. Is a second, you had a second part to that, I'm sorry. Alternative energy. I know when we talk in our project, when we talk about public purpose and need, I fully expect 
throughout uh, this, this discussion process and the comments that are made at uh, public meetings, and the FERC takes those public comments in and often asks us to respond to data requests to respond to those. I, I fully expect that renewables uh, and a discussion of renewables will play a role in this uh, um, overall review process of our project. My name is John Ryu. I live on Bardwell's Ferry Road. As I listen to your responses, I'm almost in humor about all the, oh, we don't know about that. We'll look into it. Oh, it hasn't happened yet. Well, here's something that has happened yet, okay? On August 24th, 2014, that's four days ago, in case you didn't figure that out, Forbes magazine reported that Kinder Morgan was fined last year for breaking dozens of safety violations during construction. I want to emphasize the word construction of the Rocky Mountain Express Pipeline. According to the Department of Transportation, the fine was nearly $1 million. The violations included failing to test safety devices, including proper pressure stabilization measures, failing to adequately inspect the pipeline, failing to maintain firefighting equipment, failure to maintain current map locations. Other violations include improper welding that resulted in cracked seams along the pipe. Given this information, why should we trust you? You're, uh, I, I'm familiar with the Forbes article. Uh, it also had a number of other um, statements in it. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, we operate 80,000 miles of pipeline across North America. We're the largest pipeline company that's in operation, servicing all parts of the country. Um, and we have a lot of construction projects. Um, and I'm not saying we're a perfect company. I'm not going to agree with every one of the allegations made by a contributor to Forbes magazine. Uh, but I'm not saying we haven't had issues uh, and have, have construction when we have construction. It's, it's a construction project. It's a, it's, a, it's a large, lengthy process. The important thing is if there are mistakes that are made or corrections that need to be made in the process, you fix them. And we publish our safety record on our website. We're the only energy company that does that. So you can go to our website right now and see what our safety record is as compared to all the other energy companies uh, in our field, and it's very good. I think if you look on balance, um, that we have a very good record. Um, but we're always looking for ways to improve as, as a company. And I know our project management team that's here tonight and our land team and others are working very hard to do that. So what we're committed to do is what we've done in New England for 60 years. Again, not perfect, not everything. Uh, going according to our plans, but we're going to continue to strive to be a better company, and when we have problems, we'll fix them. Roy. Can you hear? Yeah. Roy Cohen is my name. I live on Roaring Brook Road in Conway. And... Uh, there are so many questions. Uh, I'm really going to, I'm forced to really limit uh, what I'm going to say in the, uh, in the interest of not hogging the, uh, the podium here or the uh, microphone. Uh, I, I, well, this kind of, uh, have you, are you familiar with the expression, if you build it, they will come? And I don't know if you're familiar with uh, some of the highways in the region, uh, notably maybe the Mass Pike from Framingham on into Boston, or I'll even say the Long Island Expressway from uh, Queens into Midtown Manhattan. Uh, basically, the highways, like the pipes, became full. In the case of uh, Boston, they really didn't do too much. They still debate it. They, um, 
nobody says necessarily less people should come to Bo into Boston, and perhaps, and I'm not going to, by the same token, I'm not going to argue uh, that less gas should be used, even though uh, there are quite a few arguments uh, that would point in that direction. Uh, but I would say, in the case of uh, the New York area, they built another level on the Long Island Expressway, and guess what? It filled up just the same. It really doesn't solve the problem. So I would suggest, uh, particularly, and, and it seems like you really write this off at the very top, um, you know, uh, looking at existing rights of way and even your existing pipeline. I ask you the question, uh, there are very few problems, I think, of a physical nature that money can't solve, okay? So if, in fact, the FERC and the, and the other regulating agencies, of which I really put minimal value in, uh, in what they may have to say because they have interests that aren't necessarily coincidental with my interests and with the rest of, the rest of our interests as townspeople and residents here, um, Let's, let's say, for example, we have a homeowner in Everett or in Salem or wherever, and they're a natural gas customer. They heat their home with natural gas. And let's say they spend 2000 bucks in a, in a season heating with natural gas. If you spent the extra money on the, uh, on the beefier construction, the safer construction, to run an expanded pipeline in the so-called congested areas, what would be the impact on that homeowner? Would it be an extra $100 a, year, a season? Would it be 50 Are you going to tell me it would be double? I, I, and so I have to ask that kind of question. Again, if you build it, they will come. You put in a 30-inch pipe, you're going to fill it up with gas one way or another, or fill it up with something. And I would suggest it would be in your interest to find out what those compounds are, because some of them may be corrosive to your, your project as well. So that's my, my statement, I guess. I don't know that I have any uh, real question other than you're free, to, you're free to make your comments on it. Well, uh, I will just say that the, the contracts that into with the local distribution companies still need to be reviewed and approved by the Department of Public Utilities. So they need to determine that they are uh, in the best interest of the ratepayers who are going to be part of that rate paying structure. So they're going to be looking at and analyzing uh, the, the value of that to those customers. So whether or not uh, the cost of that, and I, I'll take that a step further, is we're often asked too, will this pipeline lead to lower gas prices for those who currently receive gas? If you're, say, you're a ratepayer for Berkshire Gas, will this pipeline mean lower gas prices on your gas bill? And no one can say that it will or it won't, and someone that suggests that it will is it's speculation, or that it won't, it's speculation. What it what does mean is there there will be additional natural gas. But will that mean that it's a lower prices? Who can forecast four years from now what natural gas prices will be? But what we enter into needs to be approved by the Department of Public Utilities um, in, in the interest of ratepayers. In the back. Hi, I'm uh, Z. I live here in Conway. Um, I want to thank the select board for actually asking uh, Kinder Morgan, Morgan to come speak tonight. Um, this has been really informative. Um, I keep this is really concerning to me. Um, I keep hearing statements like "We're just a messenger. We just take the oil from the guys that do the bad stuff and all the fracking, and don't worry about your wells because that's not us. And we're going to put a pipeline through your community." And then we're going to sell it to some other people over there. And nobody's, we're, we're the middle guy. We're not the bad guy. We're, you know, and it's like there's a lot of finger pointing. And the problem is, is you keep saying we're just a messenger. Well, we are just the people who live here. That's a problem for me. Um, so, you know, some of the things that you're saying, just like you, you what you get out of this is money. What we get out of this is potentially having our home destroyed. Um, it, you know, there's, we've been to many different presentations about 
uh, you know, all the horrible things that can happen and the fact that our fire department might not be able to handle uh, a full-on, you know, pipeline explosion because, I mean, we've got, you know, like a lot of uh, infrastructure around here, but we're a small town. We don't have, you know, a huge barrage of uh, um, fire equipment to handle this. Um, I also, the main question that I have is you mentioned that the DOT did not want your pipeline near the Mass Pike. And you said they didn't want that. Well, why didn't they want that? Because if it was for safety reasons, then why would we want that in our town? <laughs> well, so the, the, we're, we're, we've, we've met with Mass DOT a couple of times, and they haven't ruled out uh, potential co-location opportunities with uh, existing infrastructure. For example, there may be an area along Route 13, there may be areas along Route 2, there may be areas along other roadways. The Mass Pike is a different type of system and, you know, there's the, there is the, the, the median or the middle of between the four lanes, but there, there are a number of challenges with that, including the potential future expansion of the Mass Pike itself. So there, there are conflicting interests there. That's not to say, though, that there aren't other areas where we could look at co-location more, and we are doing that. Last question. Mike Shashua, uh, East Guinea Road. So you've been proposing that your pipeline will service companies that exist that are natural gas companies. And it's assuming that because they have companies, they already have a supply. Why not increase the size of the pipes that you already have to supply these companies? Because you're not supplying any new companies. You're supplying areas that already exist, that already have a supply of gas coming to them. Why not use a bigger pipe? Well, first off, there are some new locations where existing customers are being, are being serviced. For example, <coughs> here, up here, there's a couple of proposed meter stations along this corridor. There's, there's a connector here. There's a connector here. So there's several areas where the same customers in the area are are taking gas in different locations so they can have deliverability in those locations where they currently don't have the deliverability. Now as far as going through existing pipes, I think you were saying why don't you just expand your existing pipes to do that. At this point, the capacity of this line is about 1.1, 1.2 billion a day um, flow and it's full. It's at full capacity. So there's no... What, what size pipe is that? Okay. There's, there's three pipelines coming into Massachusetts. There's... Two go to Drake. It. There's, there's three that come in here at the start. They're 30-inch, 24-inch, and 36-inch. Then there's... From this point on into Hopkinton, Massachusetts, there's two pipelines. There's a 24-inch and a 30-inch. The original line was a 24-inch in 1955. It was expanded over the years. The 30-inch was put in, what we call line two, and then line three was the 36-inch that extended through the Berkshires in, in, from New York State in this direction. From, from Hopkinton North, there's smaller lines, 24s and 16, on that area. When we looked at our alternatives, in order, this line itself will, one single line, a 30-inch, has capacity up to 1.2 billion a day. So you're almost doubling the capacity coming in. In order to do that on this line, you would have to put that same line, which is a higher pressure line, along that same route for a longer distance. And one of the things we looked at was because of the growth in that area, it just at this point was not feasible, and we're going to show it in our alternative analysis, to be able to increase this pipeline to meet those deliverable, deliverable deliveries. But you've already impacted those areas. You're, you're suggesting to impact a whole new area is more feasible than taking an existing area where the impact is already there. Instead of increasing that size, you just think it's a cost issue. It's Whereas you're not looking at the cost of impacting a pristine land area. You know, 
Well, that area is presumably already polluted. I mean, well, stick with that. There's, there, there are, there, there's not pollution along a lot of these areas, and a lot of it, because, you know, you talk about property values, we've had those pipelines where houses have built up all around it, and we actually have to deviate into greenfield areas. So there are impacts environmentally along that route also. All right, sir, you have last question, Sandra. I guess, first of all, I would like to suggest that this conversation continue until everyone feels they've had an opportunity to get their questions answered. If people feel the meeting is too long and they're tired, people are free to leave earlier. So I hope we continue. Okay, my question. Um, Penn Energy Research, which is an industry source, has indicated that, and I quote, the United States shale reserves have plummeted, unquote, specifically with a 42% decline overall. In particular, the data pertaining to the Marcellus shale, which be, would be the gas source for this transmission pipe proposal, <coughs> show that the original duration estimates made in 2011 were 17 years, but last year that estimate dropped to six years. This suggests that we could be making considerable irreversible sacrifices for a very limited gas supply instead of investing our resources in a sustainable future. Quite revealing is the fact that a number of business publications have indicated that even investors have become very skeptical about this short-sighted proposal. With that in mind, I would like to ask why would we possibly want to risk our conservation areas and our precious resources that are irreplaceable for a short-term proposal that is profiteering for you, but not for us. I'm not sure that there was a question there, but uh, uh, you know, the, the you, we keep raising some of these questions. I've heard now 7, 3, 13, 30, 50, 75, 100. What, what is the Marcellus Shale? How much gas does it have? Um, that's, that's, you know, this is, a, this is a policy debate as well. I mean, uh, we're, we're a pipeline company. We build pipelines, but we're part of it. And we just happen to be here at a time when the, the north, Northeast and New England are facing uh, record energy prices over here and a, a sincere interest in going more to renewables over here. So how, is, how does that mix play together? We're not gonna decide that at the end of the day. It's gonna be a discussion and a debate decided by all of you and the regulators and the elected officials and others. So we're proposing what we believe, one company, but the, but the company that provides most of the gas currently to New England, Tennessee Gas, and has for 50 years, we're proposing a project that we believe that will address these long-term energy needs. That's what we're doing. And there's going to be a long, lengthy debate about it. Uh, and we'll abide by whatever decision the regulators put forth. So, um, you know, those, that's where we are in this process. And 31 town hall meetings, we're probably going to have 10 open houses and 10 scoping meetings and two years of discussion and, or three years of discussion and regulatory review and debate. Um, that's why we're here tonight is to hear. And I hope we have, uh, as we have at most of our meetings like this, some productive discussions about particular land and particular sensitive areas um, in an area that we're impacting, uh, like Conway. So uh, it's all important. So uh, you know, if we have more questions like that, my answer is probably going to be the same. We're just here to listen. We're here to hear your feedback. But at the end of the day, we're one piece in a large discussion. All right, we'll take a couple more questions that are new questions, not something we've already gone through. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Colleen Filler and live in Conway, and this is a pipeline question. And it has to do with the kinds of pipes that you can use when you go through rural areas versus the kinds of pipes you might use when you go to other areas. I think that should be something that is very much in your area of expertise. 
and I hope that for the public record you could tell us what is the difference between the pipeline you can use in this area and what information do you have about those particular dangers versus the kind of regulations that might be required for higher population areas? Yeah, very. The, um, first off, the pipe is, is steel pipe, all um, quality controlled through the manufacturer. It's all welded when it's installed, and it's, and it's all, all the welds are x-rayed. The welds in time in, through metallurgical tests are stronger, stronger than the pipe itself. So it's a, it's a solid pipeline. Now what you're getting to on the pipe, you have the diameter, which is your, the, the diameter of the pipe. We're looking at 30 or 36 inch. And by federal regulation and code, based on population density, you have three class locations determined by population density. You have a class one, which is more of a rural area. On a, on a location, it's so many homes with, or residences within so far of the pipeline on a sliding mile. So if you could imagine a sliding mile, and that we consider this a rural, rural area. A lot of what I see here, we haven't done all the design. It would be classified a class one according to code. The second class is a class two where it's a little more populated. Maybe, um, I think like it's 40-some houses in an area. Maybe a sparse, relatively... Uh, populated one a little subdivision and then in class three you're correct in a populated uh, area would be a class three pipe what this is based on the wall thickness of the pipe the wall thickness of the pipe still is at it has a design factor that's well above the operating factor for all of the pipe so all of the pipe is safe all of the pipe is installed safely but there is by federal code Thicker wall thickness pipe in higher populated areas. Similarly, when we cross river crossings or we cross road crossings, there's, high, there's thicker pipe. But all the pipe is designed well above the operating pressure. It's all tested by putting water in the pipe, pressurizing it for eight hours prior to con after construction for, for, to make sure there's not any defects and it's pressurized well above what the operating pressure is of the pipe. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to address that earlier, but I can't speak for that project. I can speak for Kinder Morgan. As far as in our engineering, I'm in the engineering department, I'm in the construction department. We've, we, we've, our processes, the way we construct, our contracting, it's quality materials, it's quality labor we use, it's quality inspection, there's a lot of oversight. I'm a project manager over construction, I've got some of my co-workers here. It's a long process and I take exception that we're going to build a non-safe pipeline. It's going to be safe from the design when we do the routing to make sure we have it in a safe location when we route it all the way through the construction and installation of that pipeline. It's a very safe operating system, the, the pipelines that we design and build. Jim Moore, Conway, I, I don't think I need that. Um, and I lived here for a long time and I really love this place and that's why all of you are here too. And one of the things that has been hinted at and sort of mentioned, this is a non-renewable resource that Kinder Morgan wants to make all the money out of it while it can. If it's five years or 50 years, the corporation is going to continue to exist and is going to continue to try to buy the rights to do what it wants to do to make a profit. But it's a non-renewable resource. If Kinder Morgan and our government, and FERC, and all of those other people really care about this country and care about its people, and they have billions, billions of dollars to spend. Why don't they invest those billions of dollars and get us on the right track for renewables <laughs> instead of what <laughs>
Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja. Ja, ja. Ja, ja. Ja, ja. So, yeah, well, again, the, the, the larger policy discussion here, which includes renewables, I've mentioned it before, you know, even a company like Kinder Morgan, that's the leading transporter of natural gas in the country, even we talk about natural gas being a bridge energy, being a bridge to renewables. We talk about that. We know that that is a bridge to renewables. We know that that any, any energy scenario talks about renewables someday being able to take the place of non-renewable sources of energy. The question is, when will that happen? Will it happen this winter? Next winter? Next winter? Well, we know now there is a crisis, a natural gas crisis in the region, and there's not enough infrastructure to address it. You have a crisis here. How you deal with it, if you think you can deal with the renewables tomorrow, I encourage you to do that, but I don't think you can. I think you're going to need additional natural gas supply as a bridge to get where you want to go and what most people, including us, think will eventually happen. There's no natural gas here. Yeah, Zero natural gas in this town. I realize that. Okay, well, I do know that the uh, Massachusetts had the highest gas prices in the country. Your neighboring states did not have the highest gas prices in the country. And I'm not sure what exactly you're referring to, but that's a fact. You had the highest gas prices in the country. So whatever was happening here, uh, other states weren't experiencing. And the only thing different there was you had a limitation on infrastructure. New York just last year completed two major infrastructure projects to service New, New York City. We had one of them. Spectre Energy had another. They didn't have the problem that you did because they expanded their infrastructure three years ago and went in service last year to address. Uh, it was for, uh, fortuitous that they didn't know there was going to be a polar vortex last year, but it happened, and that led to part of this uh, major crisis in the last year. But all the states around you and all the states in the country aren't experiencing what you have, and the difference is a lack of infrastructure. Um, my name is Tom Andrews. I am a business manager for the Laborers Union out of Holyoke, Massachusetts. So I represent about approximately 500 construction workers that live right up the Pioneer Valley uh, corridor, right, right up Route 91. And I think I got more of a, a comment rather than a question to Kinder Morgan. Kinder Morgan has signed a uh, an agreement with the laborers union and what that means is job opportunities right here up in the Pioneer Valley in the Pioneer Valley area as we all know there's a very lack of jobs in the construction industry in Massachusetts if you go down into the Boston and the Eastern Masters work all over the place in in Western Masters not as much work and one of our things is Kinder Morgan has signed an agreement with the laborers union. Basically, what's that saying is that they are actually going to put approximately 3,000 construction workers to work. And those 3,000 construction workers, the majority are going to come right out of the Pioneer Valley area. That's going to put food on the, on the tables. That's going to put benefits for my members. That's actually going to provide insurance and, and, and other things for these guys. So one of the things, and I know I, I live here in the Berkshire County, and I understand that running this gas line is there's a lot of controversy of running it through this area. And it's not going through Berkshire County, a very little bit through Berkshire County, but it's really running up through Route 2, and I understand that. And I understand your concerns about this gas line but one of the biggest things that my concerns is how we provide actually jobs jobs is one of the biggest things that one of my concerns about in this area and I know people don't agree with it I know there's people who don't agree with this whole thing but Kinder Morgan has signed a an agreement with the laborers union as for the safety record I think 
Kinder Morgan is one of the safer companies out there. Is there problems on every construction job site? Absolutely. There are problems on your local job sites. It could be from building dorms at UMass. It could be building, it could be building bridges down on Route 91. Is there problems? But one of the things you have to understand is how does a company actually, actually solve the problem? How do they respond to the problem, and how do they solve the problem? So those are one of the two things that you've got to think about. Kinder Morgan is a safe company. We work with them across the state, all the way across the United States. We work with Kinder Morgan. Laborers are always installing pipes, and that's one of the things that Kinder Morgan does, that they provide actually good jobs in this area. Pixie? Pixie Holbrook from Bardwell's Ferry Road. Um, I want to try to tie some of these last comments together by talking about need, um, need for jobs and need for better energy um, to our area. Um, as you know, the opposition has been pretty powerful all across the state. Um, and the governor did actually speak to uh, five of our representatives. He originally gave us 15 minutes, but decided to give us 45. At the end of that time, he was able to really see that we need to question the need for an additional gas pipeline. Um, we're finding out that if we could fix the immense amount of leakage that's going on, we can do two things, prevent a second pipe or an additional pipe, and we can get jobs for people. Lots and lots of jobs. We understand their need, we feel for them, but you could get green jobs fixing these pipes. We would get more gas and you'll get some jobs. We can also conserve more and we can obviously do renewables. So the point is, we don't need mine. Um, Three of uh, Patrick's uh, energy committee members, they quit. They resigned last month because they said that, that supporting a pipeline violated the commitment that, the, that uh, the Patrick administration had said to we need to stop fossil fuels. So my question is, if ultimately the governors uh, decide that this is not a good idea, would you build it anyway? Well, the regulators have to approve the project, uh, and not just the FERC, uh, the state of Massachusetts and the Department of Energy and Environment, which is under the purview of Governor Patrick now and the next governor, will also need to secure permits from those agencies. So if the agencies don't give us the permits or grant us the permits or the FERC doesn't grant us the certificate, we won't build it. Hi, I'm Vicki Elson from Conway. Did you all see those people with the signs outside saying, I live here and I support the pipeline? Are those people here that were holding those signs? You were one of those people? Okay, I just was wondering if they were real people. Okay, do you know those other guys? Has anybody ever seen any of those other guys? Do you live in Conway? Where do you live? Okay, so none of those people are in this room. None of those people are from Conway. My question is, how much did those guys get paid to hold those signs? And how much are you being paid to stand in front of a room full of people who are having such a hard time feeling like we want to be your friends. Okay, we're going we're gonna to have a rebuttal to that question. Go ahead. The gentlemen that were outside, they live in Waitley and in Turner's. Okay, so that's where they're from. Are we getting paid by Kinder Morgan? Absolutely not. Not one of us has received a thing from Kinder Morgan. Kinder Morgan has signed a memorandum of understanding with us in return saying that if this, jo if this job goes through, they're going to use my members to install that pipe. 
in return, why did Kinder Morgan come to the Laborers Union? Because we have a training facility, because we're going to provide the safest laborers on the job site. So do we live in this area? Do we live in Conway? I have like four members that live in Conway. Unfortunately, they didn't want to come tonight. I offered them. They didn't want to come. But in return, do I have members that live right up where, the, where other parts of this pipe is going to go? Absolutely. And, and can I just say something? And I, we're for that. We're for putting a windmill in solar fields and making houses more energy efficient. We are absolutely, that's what we do. But as a union and as people are trying to feed their families, there's not as much work out there. So we have to chase every opportunity that there is. So, and that's a, that's a, it's a $4 billion job. I, I would build windmills from here until the western side of the country for it. We are absolutely for it. So it's not like we put all our cards in the, into this pipeline, but this is something that we have to actually got to chase also. Hi, my name is Steve Dinklocker. I live on Graves Road in Conway. Um, every, some people have talked about safety here. You've been operating in Massachusetts now for over 50 years. Can you describe the last incidents of the operation of the pipeline? Not the construction, but the operation where you've had any fatalities, injuries, damages in Massachusetts or any other state? Steve, good evening. Um, as I said, I'm Jim Hartman, and I've been, uh, I live in Westfield. I'm local. I'm Hamden County. Uh, my career's been with Tennessee Gas. I started in 1980, so I've been here for 34 years. And when I first started, um, really the only incident that I recall throughout my career was uh, in Sandusfield, Massachusetts. And we were constructing a pipeline, and there was uh, blasting activity that was happening. And the contractor had subcontracted blasting to a third party that didn't hold the license. So there was a third party that was doing the blasting. They caused the blast so that a rock landed on the existing pipeline, that 24-inch pipeline, and it ruptured. It didn't explode. It released gas. And of course, it's very frightening. It is. And that was in 82. So since that time, I'm not familiar with any other release of, of that magnitude of, of gas. What you do find that happens a lot is third party activity. Someone putting in a continental cable, someone digging a sewer, and they didn't call 811. And they damage our pipe by hitting it. And then they cover it up and they don't tell us. And what can happen over time is that pipe can can flex and it can get weaker and one of the things that Mark talked about that's so important is that we put a smart tool through that pipe he called it a smart pig and it identifies things like that so we take that extra care years ago it wasn't required since other incidents in the country have happened it, ha it is now required but we've been doing it far before anyone else was doing it so we are very proactive in what we do. We're very passionate about what we do. Mark's been doing it as long as I have. We started our careers together in New Hampshire in 1980. And we've been building pipeline, working with landowners for a lot of years. And we'll do our very best for you. Thank you. Cindy, you have a question? La last question, Cindy. Hi, my name is Cindy Wilmat, and I live right here in Conway. And I'm one of those people who I'm not against the pipeline, and I'm not for the pipeline. I'm merely here to collect information. And I, too, thank the selectmen for holding this meeting tonight. But in all the information that I've been getting in over the past several months, 
I just have this one burning question, and you just mentioned it again, and nobody kept followed up with it. So we don't have that big of a population here, so we require a good pipe. And if you have more of a population, you require a better pipe. And if you have a lot of population, you require the best pipe. We, I have been fortunate enough, enough to live in Conway to see the population of Conway double. So I don't know when that's going to happen again. But I would think that we would want to use the best pipe. And I know it probably comes down to money and what the federal regs say that you can and can't do. But why would you not use the best pipe everywhere? Well, all the pipe is good pipe. All the pipe is high quality pipe. The reason for the regulation in the codes is in a class one location, in a rural location, in a class two, in a three, it's primarily based on the risk that Jim was talking about of third party exposure is a big part of it. If you're in a rural area, the chance of ever coming in and touching that pipe is very remote. If you're in a densely populated area where they're putting utilities across the pipeline, you, that's why at road crossings we put a heavier wall pipe. At road crossings we'll put concrete on the pipe in the roadway. And it's to prevent that backhoe that Jim was talking about, when it touches that pipe, we want to make sure that that pipe has, is as strong as possible to protect that on the risk area. It is not an unsafe pipe to put class one pipe. It's still, it's still designed at 72%. If you have 100% here, it has a safety factor of 28% in that. It's never operated anywhere near the maximum stress of that pipe. So I just want to say it's safe pipe. It's built safely. And in high density areas and in special circumstances, heavier wall pipes put in. For example, if if a pipeline along the growth area, if the population density increases at certain times, we have to go back in as an operator and put in higher density pipe. But it is safe pipe, it is high quality pipe for this entire system. I want to thank the, uh, the Laura Hannes from Conway. If you can't answer all of these questions, why weren't the regulators part of this? They will be. Um, at, this is, again, is an informal uh, process tonight. We're here voluntarily. The Board of Selectmen asked us to come here, uh, much like the 31 other town halls that, that we have done, usually the three of us, or I've done all of them, and these guys have done a lot of them. Uh, these are voluntary meetings that we're doing before the formal process starts. Once the formal process starts, you'll see us again, but you'll also see regulators. So at our open houses, I suspect, I expect there'll be members of uh, FERC there, there'll, there'll be members of state agencies there, and then at the FERC scoping meetings where they're public hearings, those will be actually hosted by FERC, where they'll have representatives of the, the Energy Commission staff there taking comments and answering questions. That will come. I want to thank the, uh, the Kinder Morgan team for being here tonight. And thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, John.